Barrel crowns, dialing back to zero, truck guns, and more this week on Mail Call Monday. I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. We're here on another lovely Monday, and we've got questions, so let's get to it. Our first question comes from Gene. He asks, Barrel Crown, why so many, and what are they all for? Well, Gene, when we're talking about barrel crowns, the crown is actually the portion of the rifling right at the muzzle. We're not talking about all the other stuff around it, the threading, the different shapes. We're just talking about that transition from the rifling to the muzzle. And usually this is cut in an angle about 45 degrees, sometimes slightly different off of that to give it a nice clean transition from that rifling to the muzzle. This is the last thing the bullet touches as it leaves the muzzle and this is where the gas starts to escape around the bullet. So we want that to be as perfect as possible. We want it to be as even as possible all the way around the bullet so the bullet doesn't get one last push from one side or the other. Now all the rest of the stuff that you see, recessed crowns, target crowns, threaded muzzles, all this stuff, is just window dressing or a manner to protect the actual crown itself. Uh, on, for instance, the uh, Marine Corps M40, uh, those rifles generally had a ra uh, recessed crown, so the muzzle came to a raised lip to protect the edge of the crown. That way if you ran it into the ground or ran it into a rock, tree, what have you, the actual crown, that transition for the rifling, stayed protected. Uh, since we have gone beyond that to muzzle devices now, uh, if you have a muzzle device on your rifle, then that crown is already protected by the muzzle device. This is one of the reasons I like to run brakes on my match rifles. Uh, they give you a little bit of recoil reduction to begin with, but since we're already talking about heavy tactical rifles, it's not a massive amount, but the big deal is I want that crown protected when I'm moving, going through barricades, all this stuff. So really, it's just that transition. And the, from talking to different gunsmiths, different custom rifle builders, the exact angle of that transition does not matter as much as the fact that it's perfectly concentric to the rifling. So you want it to be absolutely perfect to the rifling. Um, 45 degrees seems to be a very popular uh, break that they put on it, but they're just breaking the edge so it's nice and smooth. Hope that answers your question on that. Jeremy asks, methods for returning to zero on scopes without a zero stop after dialing your shot. Well, Jeremy, if you're just shooting on the line, you finished a stage, you're getting ready to pick up and move, I always recommend just dialing the scope back to zero. Um, that's really all there is to it. Just return your setting to zero. You know if you dialed up however many uh, minutes of angle or however many mils for that last target, just come back down, set the turret to zero, and roll on. Now, if you get to another stage and you can't remember if you dialed up or dialed down or the turrets got rolled in the bag or something, uh, then if you don't have a zero stop, it can be a little bit more tedious to get back to zero. If you're working with a scope that does not have a zero stop, then there are two things that I recommend. The first is that most scopes, when you look at the turret, they will have hash marks to tell you what rotation that dial is on. So as you turn the turret up on most of them, it will expose more of those hash marks. In your data book, when you get the rifle zeroed, draw a picture of what those hash marks look like. That way, if you get dialed off and you're a full rotation off, then more of those hash marks or less of those hash marks will be exposed depending upon how far you're off. Then it's a simple matter to look at your data book and dial it back to zero until they're the same number of hash marks as in your picture. Do this for both the elevation and the windage turrets. Now, if either your scope doesn't have hash marks or as a backup to that, once you get your scope zeroed, dial the turret all the way down until it bottoms out. Now be careful, you don't really want to crank it after it bottoms out, but all the way until the scope turret will not easily move down. Count those clicks 
as you dial down. So you can note in your data book that your zero is so many clicks up from absolute bottom. That way, if you get into a situation where you have totally screwed up your revolutions, you have no idea which turn you're on, then you can bottom the turret out and you can come back up however many clicks you noted in your data book and you know you'll be zeroed back out. Those are the two easiest ways to take care of that if you do not have a zero stop. Steve asks, is it possible to get a firing solution using only a wristwatch with altitude, barometer, thermometer, and an FDAC? Well, Steve, absolutely. First of all, you're going to want to have a very good knowledge of what your muzzle velocity is. Then you can grab your adaptive FDAC and you can just simply turn it over and look at the table on the back. And the table on the back will give you your density altitude based upon your temperature and your pressure. So you can get that lined out and you'll be very close. Now it's always better to have a full-on ballistic calculator because it will give you finer resolution, but the FDAC and a watch such as the Casio Pathfinder that I use is a really good option. Now one thing to bear in mind when you're using a watch that gives you temperature and barometric pressure is you want to make sure that first of all that that watch is calibrated correctly read your owner's manual for the watch and make sure it's zeroed out where it needs to be many of them will run off a reference altitude so you want to make sure you have the correct reference altitude dialed in and then you need to take the watch off your body and let it climatize to the actual ambient temperature before you attempt to use it if you keep it strapped on your wrist underneath your jacket sleeve etc it's not going to give you an accurate temperature reading. So take it off, strap it to your pack strap, tra strap it to your shooting bag, your mat, you know, something where it's not going to pick up heat or cold that is beyond what the atmosphere has. So just bear that in mind. But the FDAC is a really, really good tool, and we'll leave a link to the uh, field density altitude calculator in the description below. Austin asks, here's a fun one, what's your take on general purpose truck rifle if used for those opportune moments on wild hogs, unscheduled plinking with friends, and medium range steel? What would be the setup? Thanks, and keep premiering great new shows. Well, thanks for watching, Austin, and you know, truck guns, just informal plinking guns can run the gamut from you know, semi-automatic AR type rifles to bolt action precision rifles. For me personally, I think that if I was just gonna have a truck gun to throw in the uh, under the back seat, you know, grab it out whenever I need to either put down a varmint or just planking with friends, I think I would go with a 16 inch AR with a free floated handguard set up in kind of a precision setup, but not with too heavy a barrel on it. And I'd go with a low magnification optic on it, maybe a three to nine power scope collapsible stock you know that way I have the opportunity to either use that rifle for defense if necessary it would be a small quick handling rifle but it still has the ability to reach out 500 600 yards when loaded with the appropriate ammunition now if you don't want to go on the semi-automatic area maybe that's not legal in your area then something like a nice compact 16 inch 308 either a savage model 10 or a remington 700 in like a bell and carlson stock again with about a three to nine power scope on it is going to be a very good very handy rifle something in a 16 inch barrel with a varmint contour like remington varmint contour is going to be really light really easy to handle now the flip side of that is it's going to have a little bit more recoil so i would put a break on it for both the reasons of reducing some of that recoil and keeping the rifle shooting a little bit flatter, but also to protect that crown, protect that muzzle. If you're just throwing it in the bed of the truck or throwing it in the back or throwing it in the trunk of your car, uh, you want that muzzle protected. So that's kind of a good idea, but what for a truck or informal planking gun, I like to keep something light and something handy. I don't want to get a great big huge 18 pound precision rifle because it's really just not fun to be able to grab that thing and shoot whenever you want. Um, it's really a more concerted effort to get it out and get it set up. When you start getting into heavy rifles like that, they really require a bipod to shoot effectively, whereas a light 
rifle, like a 16 inch AR or a 16 inch bolt gun, uh, you can sling it up and you can shoot it just using uh, you know, vehicle as a rest or using improvised shooting positions very easily. So that's my take on it. Um, I want to hear what you guys would do with just an informal truck gun, plinking rifle, something of that nature. Go ahead and leave it in the comments below on what you would build for that kind of purpose. Um, you know, for, for the fun of it, let's say you need to keep the price range under $1,500. Because um, I know there's some really crazy stuff out there. But I want to keep it kind of realistic, give guys an idea of things that they could build. So let's say keep the price range around $1,500 and let us know in the comments below on what you would build for your truck gun or informal plinking rifle. Benson asks, I'm having trouble getting MOA accuracy out of my M&P 15. Would putting a free float handguard help or would a new barrel be a better choice? Thanks for all the great videos. Well, Benson, I would definitely put a free float handguard on it. And the reason is that with regular handguards, anything that you're using for support, bipod, even just your hand, or slinging the rifle, is going to disrupt the harmonics of that barrel. It's not going to be able to vibrate the way it should. You're not going to really get consistent shot-to-shot -shot harmonics, and this is going to open your group up. Just simply putting a free float handguard on your current rifle may increase the accuracy, but it may not. I don't know how good your current barrel is and what kind of ammunition you're shooting through it. But what I can tell you is even if you go to a premium match barrel, you're still not going to get the most out of that barrel unless you put a free float handguard on. So a free float handguard on is the starting point that you want to go from from there. So I would suggest putting a free float tube on it, and then see how your current barrel is shooting, and then determine if you need to upgrade the barrel beyond that. TJ asks, if you cannot shoot suppressed rifles in your area, is there really much point to the 300 blackout? Well, TJ, that's going to be a lot of opinion on my part, and there are a lot of circumstances that are going to come into it. Uh, I have a couple of 308 semi-automatic rifles available to me. So for me, 300 blackout holds no interest unless I'm going to build a compact suppressed subsonic system. A supersonic 300 blackout is really just an anemic 308 or, you know, pretty much equivalent to an AK-47. More accurate AK-47, but that's the kind of round that we're looking at, a 7.62x39. So I don't see any purpose in building a 300 blackout unless you're going to run subsonic and suppressed. The whole purpose of the 300 blackout was to be able to run a subsonic round in an AR platform and still have enough power to cycle the action. Now those of you guys out there that may want a 30 caliber rifle on the power level of a 762 by 39 but you already have an AR, then you may have a good reason to build a full um, supersonic 300 blackout setup. But for me, it just really doesn't hold any interest. The 300 blackout is going to deliver a good deal of energy. Some of you may want to use that for a deer hunting uh, cartridge. I know some guys here, because of Indiana laws, have started building up 300 blackout pistols. Uh, to be able to deer hunt with them because they give more power than a 357 Magnum would. So there are a bunch of different considerations, but if you're just generally talking about going out and plinking and shooting, then I don't see a whole lot of purpose behind a 300 blackout supersonic without a suppressor unless you just want to do it to do it. That's my opinion on it. Um, I would prefer to build a 308 and have the extra reach because the 300 blackout just really doesn't have anywhere near the reach that a 300 Winchester or a 308 Winchester does. So that's my opinion on it. Jerry asks, Mercury recoil rod, do they work or are they just another gimmick? My son's determined to hunt with a 30 out six and I really do not want to install a brake on a hunting rifle. I've already loaded some reduced loads for it. Any further tips to help him out? Well, Jeremy, the, the mercury rods, and I assume you're talking about the mercury recoil reducers that are basically a tube of mercury that have some heavy ball bearings in them. 
they have a hydraulic dampening effect, but they also have an effect of just adding more mass to the rifle. When you add more mass to the rifle, no matter if it's a heavier barrel or if it's a heavier stock, you are reducing the rifle's tendency to move back. Um, it's able to greater resist the force of the bullet leaving the barrel. So, yes, they will help. Whether a mercury recoil reducer would help more than just adding that amount of lead shot to the buttstock, I really can't tell you because I haven't done any tests on it. I know adding lead shot to the buttstock is a tried and true method of reducing the recoil in a rifle or shotgun. It's been done for quite some time. So there, that, there is that option. Another option is adding something like a limb saver recoil pad, because I would assume when you're out hunting, you're not gonna be firing more rounds than you need to zero the rifle. The zero the rifle, generally go out, fire one or two shots, and be done on the hunting trip. Most kids should be able to sustain light 30-06 loads for one or two shots. I've taken my boy who's 11 out, and I've let him shoot the 308 a couple of times, and he doesn't seem to be really averse to it. He's not the greatest shooter with it because it is still a heavy recoiling rifle. But for a couple of shots, he seems to make do just fine. So before going to something like a mercury recoil rod, I think I would just add a limb saver, maybe a slip-on limb saver, so that you don't have to mess with grinding anything to fit or permanently altering the rifle, and see how he does on that. If he still needs more recoil reducing, um, ability, then it may be time to add some weight to the system. Michael asks, my turrets on the Vortex Razor have a little slop or creep. How can I adjust them without stripping the set screws to be more positive? Well, Michael, you really can't. There is nothing you can do to adjust the slop in the turrets. That little bit of lash, we call it, uh, that has to do with the ball detents or the click detents that are actually in the scope. They're internal to the system. They're not external. So no amount of cranking on those set screws is going to do anything. You want to make sure that the set screws are tight enough that the turret doesn't move on that inner brass stem. But once you tighten that down, then you don't want to go any further because what you will actually start doing is in many scopes, you'll, those set screws will cut a divot into that inner brass stem and you'll have trouble zeroing your turrets out later on because they will always want to slip into those divots. So just snug them down to where the turrets are not going to move on the brass stem and then don't worry about the lash after that. Daniel asks, for someone looking to get into competitive long range shooting, where is a good place to start? What kind of matches would you recommend? Well first off, I recommend local matches check ranges near you. If you know of a range near you that has the ability to shoot rifles on uh, precision rifle type matches, then inquire. Ask them if there are any groups that are shooting either formal matches or informal matches and get with those guys. Local matches are great because they are usually really low stress. Nobody's really, really concerned about winning them. Uh, when we shoot our local matches here at Redbrush Rifle Range in Newburgh, Indiana, uh, we really, I mean, I like to win the matches. Obviously, I try to win the matches. But if we have a new shooter who's struggling, I'm less concerned about my performance than it is assisting a new shooter. And most of the other guys are like this too. So if we have a new shooter show up and he's just getting into it, we do everything we can to make him feel comfortable and to help him improve his skills um, on the range. And you really, while you will have some of that at larger matches, when guys have paid hundreds of dollars to shoot in these big matches, they're really concentrated on finishing well, putting in a good showing. So you're less likely to get the same amount of help at a large national level match than you are at your local matches. Now the flip side to that is depending upon where you're at and depending upon the guys in your area, you may have a whole lot more skill level at a national level match than you do at your local match. Now I'm lucky here in uh, Indiana, we have some really, really good shooters. Uh, at our local matches, we have some guys that really keep me at the top of my game or I won't finish at the top. So 
it just is going to depend upon your area. But local matches are the lowest cost way to get into it, and it's probably some of the cheapest training that you're going to run into. Now, you do have to temper that because it is possible that if you get guys that aren't real adept at shooting precision rifles, that they may teach you the wrong kind of stuff. So, you need to go into it with a little bit of knowledge base, and you need to go into it really questioning everything. But local matches will get you experience, they'll get you tuned up to shooting in different positions, shooting on the gun, they'll get you experienced in shooting in a competitive environment, and hopefully you'll have some guys that will help you along the way. That's all the time that we have for this week's show. I I apologize for it being a little bit short, but in my day job, I'm actually out at the range instructing low light all this week, so that's kind of taking up a whole lot of time. I'm dragging in at the end of the shift and having to still get up early the next morning, so um, we're trying to pack as much in as we can. Uh, this last week, we did start our improved AK build series, and the first installment of that was installing the Midwest Industries Extended AK Handguard on our Century Arms Wasser 10. So if you haven't seen that, please go ahead and check that video out. Uh, we do have the rest of the build already shot, and I'm in the process of editing it and getting it uploaded. So every couple of days, you should see a new episode pop up. I'm going to try to put at least a new episode up every week. I think we've got enough. We're probably going to break it down into four or five episodes. And then I still haven't shot the range portion of it yet. So we've got to get it out to the range, heat it up, dump some mags through it, and we'll come back and let you know uh, how each one of the components that we installed works and if we're going to change anything. Uh, we've still got to do the Mega Arms Ma 10 wrap up. That will be coming soon. And we also got some new parts in from SLR Rifle Works. They sent us one of their Intrepid Key Mod handguards. We got that installed on the new AR 15 build. They also sent us one of their new. Uh, adjustable gas blocks, which is a very, very nice piece. We used one on the Mega Arms Ma 10. They have sent us their upgraded and improved version that we put on this AR-15 build. Um, we've also got a couple of Bushnell scopes, and I haven't forgot about you guys that are asking about the Millet TRS-1. That is still sitting here. It still is in the works, and we will get to it. Uh, we just now got a ton of new ammo in from Southwest Ammunition. Uh, that was part of the prize table winnings from the 2013 Oregon Sniper Challenge. So now we've got that ammo in. We got about a thousand rounds in. So that will help us move forward with some of our tests and some of our stuff that we're doing with the 308s. 223 ammo is showing back up in the store. So we were able to get a hold of some of that. So it allows us to go forward and do a little bit of AR stuff as well. So stay tuned for all that. We got a lot on the plate. Hopefully we will get it busted out as quickly as possible. If you've got any questions or comments, please leave them in the comments section below or send them to us on Facebook or Twitter. If you like this episode, please make sure you like, share, and subscribe. We really need you to share these episodes out. It helps us a lot. And until next week, get out and shoot!